neuroscience, and then recognizing that some of what we thought were the best peace building programs were actually not being neurosensitive. Um, and, and his groundbreaking work with um, Roma tolerance and, or intolerance programs in Europe. And um, just saying, if we really were to devise programs based on what we know about brains, they would look very different. Mm -hmm. So the, he was one influence. The second was Jeremy Richman, yeah. who um, was a neuroscientist who'd worked for years on Alzheimer's research, whose daughter was, was killed um, in the Sandy Hook massacre. And he took his grief and made it his life's work to look at the neuroscience of violence and how we can rewire our brains for peace. And really looking at our capacity for altruism, our capacity for good, not just our capacity for violence. And so working with the two of them and with the group Beyond Conflict uh, mm -hmm. in Boston, which had really started, it, it, it is a peace building organization that had worked for years on South Africa and Northern Ireland, really taking the neuroscience research sponsoring uh, neuroscientists in their labs, but then translating that into work on issues of polarization and violence. Uh, that's what really set me thinking. So then with the sponsorship of, of your leadership, Colette, at USIP, thinking, you know, what is a different angle that we could take? And so the program Rewiring the Brain for Peace started, where we brought together neuroscientists, peace builders, but then also spiritual leaders. Mm -hmm. I think that's where, this is something that was a little bit different because it was um, recognizing that almost all cultures have different rituals and ways of coming together that can tamp down the in-group, out-group kinds of um, uh, impulses. They can bring people together across divides. And if we could bring together these subgroups and create a community of practice, we might be able to unlock how we can use our brains to build peace, or as you say, crossing our minds.